So seller financing uh, essentially is instead of the buyer going to a bank to get a loan, the seller is the one who becomes the bank. That's basically what it means, right? And I'll give you guys an example, um, but let's talk about why a seller would do that, right? So, and when it can be applicable. So let's say you have a seller. Let me, let me share my screen actually, because it's, you get a visual, it makes a lot more sense. Let's say you have someone who wants to buy a home for a million bucks, right? We use round numbers to make it easy. Make this a little bit bigger. If someone wants to buy a home for a million bucks, right? If they were to go to a bank, they might put, you know, anywhere from what, 3% to 20% down, right? They'll get a conventional loan. And what are the rates right now? Six, seven, six and a half? Seven? Yeah, I use seven. All right, 7%. Right, so they're going to have a 7% loan. They'll put anywhere from 3 to 20% down, right, depending on what loan program they go with. And the bank is the one financing the deal, right? The bank is going to loan them the difference between their down payment and the purchase price. So that's your most common scenario, right? That's how 99% of the clients out there go out and get their financing to buy a home. With seller financing, it's pretty much the same exact thing, right? Where they're going to put a down payment. Um, the seller may want them to put a little bit more down, right? To secure their, you know, their position and, and reduce the amount of risk. But let's say they might put 10 to 20% down. And then the seller lends them, lends the difference basically. And then the rate and terms are negotiable. it's not gonna be subject to whatever the rates are that the mortgages are doing, right? That the mortgage companies are doing. It's gonna be subject to whatever you guys agree upon with that seller. So that's the main difference, right? Now, why would a seller do that in today's market? They have a lot of equity in the home. They want to yeah, if they have a lot of equity in the home, right? Because they need equity, because if there's no equity, they can't lend you any money. So you're basically taking a loan from their equity. So let's say in this case, you know, you're buying the house for a million dollars. The house is completely paid off. That means the seller has a million dollars worth of equity, right? So if you put 20% down, that's 200,000. The seller says, okay, I'll lend you 800,000. I'm not going to receive my equity right now, right? All I'm going to receive is the $200,000 that you put for a down payment. And I'll lend you 800,000. I'll be the bank. Basically, I'll carry that note. I'll be attached to the property, just like the bank would. And we're going to negotiate a rate and term for you. Now the seller, it just really depends on what they're going to do with their money, right? Some sellers are selling and they don't need the money, right? They may sell and they're going to retire, right? Or they have another home or they're going to move out of state. Maybe they don't need their full million dollars. Maybe they only need a couple hundred thousand for now. Or maybe they were going to take that money and throw it into the bank anyways, and it's going to collect nothing in their bank account, right? So they would rather lend you the money and be the bank now and maybe instead of a 7%, they're gonna lend it to you at a 5% or a 4%. And there can be a set term, right? It could say, hey, I'll lend this to you for five years. And in five years, you gotta pay me off. You gotta refinance and pay me off or whatever. There's a balloon payment. The balloon payment means it's due at a certain time. So I think when my dad bought his house, he had the same thing, mm -hmm. right? When my dad bought his house way back when, probably what, 30 years ago, maybe? In the 90s. In the 90s. Uh, I think my dad bought his house for like 200 something thousand, right? Single family in South San Jose. He put a certain amount down and then the seller financed the difference. Okay. 25 grand, right? So it can also be a second loan. It doesn't have to be a, uh, just a first. It could be a first or a second or vice versa. The seller can be the first and say, hey, I'm only going to uh, finance, you know, maybe 50% of the deal. And then you got to go get a loan on a second for maybe, you know, 30%. So that's 80% total. And then you're going to put 20% down payment. So there's different, there's different ways you can do it. You can get creative with it. 
Um, but at the end of the day, it has to be a win-win, right? And there's a great opportunity to do this right now because of the market. We have rates that are high and we have sellers who do want to sell, but properties are sitting on the market. So a seller may say, hey, I'd rather, you know, I don't need all my money now, but I do want to get it sold, you know, before prices go down or the market changes even more. So I'll do you a favor. And then you're buying my house, which helps me get it sold and lock into the sales price right now. Does that make sense? Um, so it's really not that complicated. It's just finding those scenarios that fit the box, right? So you need to have a seller who has equity in their home, right? Has a good amount of equity where they have enough money to lend from the equity. Now, if the seller owes a lot of money on the property, they, the house is going for a million, they owe 900,000. There's not a lot of room to play with there to do seller financing, right? The seller is probably going to have certain things that they're going to want to verify, just like a bank would. They're probably going to want to verify your, your income or your employment, stuff like that. But it's not going to be a strenuous underwriting process like a bank would do. Because it's basically like a person to person type of deal. I think it's also works too if a family member wants to help out another family member. Yeah. Right. Family members, you know, helping someone else out. It's just basically finding those win win opportunities. Right now, you have clients right now who may be at a seven percent right conventional loan. Maybe they have good income. Maybe they have a down payment, but at seven percent, the payments are just not that affordable for them. Right. So being able to find a seller who's willing to maybe do something at a six percent or a five percent or a four percent could make the difference between that person buying the home or not buying the home. And then the seller also has a tangible asset, right? So it's not like they're investing into the stock market. It's actually, if the for some reason the, the buyer doesn't perform, they can go back and grab their house. Yeah. Get it back. So it's a more secure investment, for them, right? With a higher return, if you can get them six percent. Yeah, if you can get someone six percent, right? If the seller can get six percent on their money instead of putting it in the bank or a savings account and getting, you know, whatever it might be, very low. Um, and they still have it secured to their asset, right, to the property, then it makes a lot more sense for that seller if they don't need the money and they don't need to be liquid right now on the money, right? Because their money will be tied up, right? Question. Does the, seller hold on to the, the seller becomes a lien on the property just like a bank would. It's the same exact process as a bank, right? So the person who buys it owns the home. The seller is a lien or a deed of trust on the property in either first position or second position, depending on how we're setting that deal up. So if we see a house that's for sale by owner, is that a better chance you think? Or that could... It could be anybody. It's a house that's just for sale. You just gotta ask. That's basically what it is. We'll talk about right now, like how to find those opportunities. Um, let's see any questions on like what it means, right? What the process is. You had a question back there? So what are the logistics of the seller underwriting that buyer? And then what are the logistics of the actual closing? You know, if stuff happens, yeah. how easy or hard is that? It's the same exact process that a bank would do. So uh, the title companies are very versed in this stuff because this was common practice back in the day. Super simple. Super simple. You basically write the contract. You could even put on the contract subject to seller financing. You could put the terms and all that. You send it to them and they have to agree. They can counter offer whatever it might be, or they can say, hey, I want to see this, this stuff. And then basically you just let the title company know, hey, the seller is going to carry back this amount of money. Um, the seller, I mean, the title company prepares the paperwork. It's like actually a really simple. A note. Yeah, it's just a note. To answer your first question, though, was on what the seller is going to be looking for for the buyer, right? I think it's going to be more along the lines of very similar to what the lender is looking for, the credit, the income, stability of the job and the assets. Yeah. Um, I think if that's, we'll kind of have to line that out for them. And then some sellers may, be, they may want more information. Yeah. Right? So just depending on what the seller wants. It's up to the seller, right, at that point. But yeah. most, but like you said, most sellers are going to look for those main key factors, right? Down payment, income, credit, job, job history. Yeah. And then in regard to what, just kind of add on to what Enrique is saying, well, we've done it before when we purchased a property and used hard money and the title company pretty much, it's the same thing. The title company will kind of walk you through it and help you. You have uh, examples of the note 
and how it all reads. Yeah. Whatever, we have access it's actually a lot easier than doing a loan because it's, the note is only like two pages. It's a two page note that basically says, this is how much, this is the interest rate. These are the payments. This is when it's due. And then you have a deed of trust, which is your standard deed of trust saying who's the beneficiary and all that. And you just get it notarized. And it's like, they file it with the County and it's, Super simple. It's a lot easier than actually getting a loan. And, and the reason why is because the institutions are held at a higher standard. So they have a lot more documentation that is required for them to issue financing. Yeah. You know, for the balloon payment, people just refinance at that point. Yeah, you refinance or you could even go back and renegotiate, right? Because it's, you're dealing with the person. So let's say in five years, the loan is due and like you got a good deal you got a four percent when the rates are seven percent you go back to the seller hey seller i know i'm it's doing you know coming up next year do you mind just extending it you know or do you need your money now yeah. right and the seller may say actually you know what i don't really need the money let's go ahead and do an addendum and then i'll extend it another two years six months a year right so it's because you're just really negotiating with the person and if you've been paying on time and all that stuff then the, se the seller so is going to be willing money. and they don't need the money why wouldn't they want to just keep collecting interest if they know you're a secure deal? That's more money than they used to the they also offer, right? Yeah, and, and the thing right now is, so they can dictate their terms, right? So they can say, for example, let's say for you to get your offer accepted, they're like, all right, well, as long as you pay me this price, I'm willing to do that, right? Because they're going to make their money some way or another, right? They can charge points up front. They can say, hey, I'm going to charge you a little bit more on the price, but I'm going to finance it and I'm going to give you a, a premium interest rate. So there's all kinds of ways that you can do it um, to make it advantageous for both parties. Can, you, can, can I add something, Kike? Yeah, if they default, they would foreclose on you just like a bank would, right? They probably go hire an attorney. They start the foreclosure process. They have to issue a notice of default. And it's like a three, a three month, three month with a notice of default and then they can start the foreclosure. And then you would have to resolve something in that time or sell the property or pay them off or catch back up. And if not, they can just take the property back, sell it, pay off what you owe them, and then the person that owns it gets the proceeds, right? The rest of the proceeds. So the seller could start that off. Do they go to the escrow company or how do they, you know, find It's out? all done through the title company, right? So once you have an agreement with the seller, right, and then you put the purchase contract together and then you let title know, hey, we're doing seller financing on this. Seller has agreed to this. These are the terms. Can you prepare the note? Can you prepare the deed of trust? It's literally an email, right? Can you prepare this? This is what we're doing. Whoever we're using, Chicago Title, whatever, prepares it. They've done 50 or 60 of us for, of, of these type of things for us when we were buying a lot of uh, investment properties. So she'll send it over, you get it notarized, and then you can close the deal whenever. You don't even have to have a 30-day close of escrow because it's basically you close when you're ready to close, right? Um, Rob, what, what was your question? Uh, I just wanted to add on, guys. The, the, what Kika is explaining a lot is a very, very common practice when you're buying land lots. Um, the lands that I've been dealing with right now, this seems to be the common practice. So if you ever have a land lot uh, uh, lead that comes in and we're all getting them, I know we are through Zillow because you guys are all calling me about it. This is this seems to be the standard of financing a property like that, right? Yeah. So um, you know, take I can see this happening pretty much 90% of the time happening on land lots. So pay attention how this works because the way that Kika has been explaining it, right, is the same exact way that you would be dealing with land lots. Yeah. So if you guys couldn't hear, this is common practice when you're buying land and stuff like that. Um, a lot of landowners finance the deal. Do we think this is going to get more popular right now for homes? Absolutely. I think it's going to get more popular just because of the nature of the market. Anytime you have like a market that's tightening up, then people start coming up with creative ways, right. right? To try to make deals happen, you know? So it's sometimes we're trying to play by like the rules that everyone's giving us, right? Because that's what we're used to. And there's so many other ways that you can actually do financing, right? There's other ways that we're not even talking about where you can assume someone's loan. It could be subject to, right? Like subject to their financing. There's all kinds of like clauses and stuff you can put in there. It just wasn't really needed because the market was so hot. The banks were lending money like crazy. So it was just like the straightforward deals. That's what we've been used to the last few years. But as the market changes, that's when you're going to see these other opportunities come up. And this happens all the time, guys. It's a cycle, right? You go through like a traditional market, then things change and you get some creativity. Then that kind of goes back to a normal market. Then we get back to business as usual. And if you're in this business long enough, you'll see like 
you have these waves of, of how these things happen. Um, you even notice it like with some of the banks, right? When the market was really hot and everything's doing good, they started getting really creative, stated income. They start loosening their guidelines because everything's going great. And then now what do they do? They start tightening their guidelines, right? It's the same thing, right? So you got to look outside and into other ways to uh, make the deals happen. Roscoe asks, what happens if a seller passes away? What happens to the loan? If they have to get a bank loan as well, how does the seller get paid first and then the bank or both at the same time? So if someone passes away, um, I'm not sure if that can be inherited. Do you know, Blanca? Yeah, um, you can. You can. If that's an asset, right? The seller yeah, that as an asset. it could be an asset, right? Where it goes to their estate, right? Because they're the beneficiary. And it's like, all right, whoever's in charge of their estate can keep that loan going and keep collecting the interest. Chase Correct. sold the bank to Bank of America. Yeah. The, the terms remain the same. Yeah, yeah terms remain the same. Um, and then if they have to get a bank loan as well, how does the seller get paid? Get paid. So it just depends on what position, right? If the bank's going to be in first position, which the bank always wants to be in first position, right? That's right. But there are banks that do seconds too. It's yeah. just going to be a higher interest rate. So it just depends if you're getting a first or a second. And then it's just whatever proceeds are left over, that's what the seller gets, yeah, right? So basically, they would be receiving whatever loan they get and whatever down payment they get would be the proceeds the seller would be receiving. And that is correct. The sequence of events is the first lender is in first mm -hmm. position. And whether it's a second lender or a person, they're in second position. Yep. Yeah. So the payment is the payment channel is standard. Yeah. So treat, let's treat, say, treat, treat the Treat the uh, treat the uh, treat this scenario, guys, as as them being an institution. They're a bank, right? So it doesn't matter who the bank is. In this case, the bank is the seller, right? Yeah. So just treat them as the same way as it as you would treat a alliance, or the same way that you would treat Bank of America, a city mortgage. So depending on which position they're at, is the same position that they're going to end up getting paid. That's a great question, yeah. Thomas. A great question. Yeah, same thing. Um, does the lender help with this? So no, the lender is not going to help with this, but the lender, if you do have a lender involved because you're doing like a first and second, the lender is going to have to approve of it, right? So they're going to have to, you know, they're going to want to know the details of whatever you're doing with the seller, the terms. They're going to want to factor that payment into your debt to income ratio. They're going to want to factor that into the loan to value ratio, all those things. So yeah, anytime there's a bank, well, the bank wants to know who else is going to be on this property with them. So you're going to have to provide all that information to them and they're going to have to agree to have, you know, this other, you know, the seller as a loan on the property. Just like they would if it was a, a lender. Yeah. A bank. Sometimes you have a first and second with two different banks, right? Yeah. Like Bank of America is doing the first and Chase is doing the second. Thank they both got to be in agreement with each other, right? Of who's in what position and making sure that, you know, everything's presented. It's the same thing. So just substitute. Bank of America for John Smith, the seller, right? He's just the bank. That's all it is. And it's just a little easier um, because you're dealing with an individual and not a bank that makes you jump through all these hoops, you know, an underwriting to get approved. Is it kind of like a piggyback, but the second is going to be the seller? Could be. Yeah, it could be a so, piggyback. It could be a first. It could be the bank, the seller is the first, and then you get a second, a small second through a, a bank, a home equity line or a credit union or whatever it might be. As long as everyone's in agreement, then it's all good. If we're presenting this to our client and they're interested in it, would it be us, the agent, who's explaining it to them? Or would it be like, let's have them call the lender and get into details? Or it's really the title to the issue? If we, they wanted to know more and we only know so much, yeah. how do we... Um, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, if they wanted to know more and you only know so much, then who would explain this? Um, because let's say if it's just... If it's just a lender, I mean, if it's just a seller lending the money and there's not going to be a bank involved, well, then you're not going to bring a lender on the call with you, right? So it's important that you guys actually understand a little bit of how this works. And then you don't have to be the expert. You just have to understand how to give the basics, right? And then if there is a deal that's presented, you can say, hey, we're going to work with the seller. We're going to work with the title company to put it all together. And then the title company can even jump on the call with you and explain all the, log the logistics. And, and usually the title company, I've been to many um, sign-offs and the title company or the notary, they explain the terms of the notary. The payment, the first payment due date, the longevity, 20 years, 30 years. And if there's a balloon payment, they'll definitely point that out as well. But it's good for you to have the basics for you to know what it is, what type of program it is or what type of it's an option. It's an option. Yeah. Uh, 
Guys, you have to remember that when you guys are doing seller financing, you're creating the seller financing. You're creating the actual plan. You're creating the terms yourself, right? So you want to have the basics down, right? If it's going to be a 30-year term, uh, you want to you want to you want to go ahead and relay that. Now, the, when I get into them with the land lots, what happens is that we have a conversation going back and forth with the seller and the buyer themselves to come up with terms that are going to make sense for both parties, right? Yeah. And essentially, what's happening is you're creating your own plan. Right. And what's happening is once you create it, you're putting it down on paper and, and, and having both parties sign off of it, uh, sign off on it. And then at that point, you just you just have financing from the seller based on the terms that you've both created. Right. Which can mean a lot of things, guys. It can mean a lot of things. You can uh, I've seen people, uh, you know, give down, you know, five percent or three percent or, or or give higher rates or the terms may be extended. Right. So it's just now putting a, a plan together that's going to make sense for both parties, depending on their individual wants. So yeah. that's the part where as agents, we're going to have to listen and figure out what each party wants and then put things together in a form of a mortgage plan. Yeah. So if you guys couldn't hear Rob, but essentially we're creating the plan here, right? We're finding the opportunity and then we're creating the plan. And when you submit your offer, there's actually a spot on there where you can put seller financing and it might even pop up an addendum where you put all the terms that you're looking for it's like asking someone to do a rent back or some right like you're going to add an addendum hey we want a rent back of this and then you got to fill it out and then both parties have to agree so i i wouldn't for you guys right now like you know especially if this is new to you don't get so caught up on the details right now i think it's going to go to the next thing i'm going to talk about is how to how to look for these opportunities right how to identify the opportunities and then once you have an opportunity then the details can be worked out at that point, right? Question quick. Uh, so you're paying both the bank and the owner, the seller at the same time? Whoever it is, whoever's on there. It could not, right? So let, let me clarify that again. It doesn't have to be a bank on there. The okay. seller could just be the bank and there's no bank. So there could be just no. Yeah. Seller. So actually, if it's helpful, let me give you guys like three scenarios, right? So we talked about a million bucks, right? You're buying a house for a million. And let's say 200K. This is scenario one right? Uh, 200K down and then 800K seller finance, right? So you put 200,000 down and then the seller is lending you, you know, the 80%, the difference, right? And 800,000 as a seller finance, that means the seller is not going to get all his proceeds. They're only going to get the proceeds from the 200,000 that you put down minus whatever closing costs, because there's going to be commissions, closing costs, and all that stuff. So let's say the seller walks away with 150 grand in his pocket after closing costs, and then the seller is the bank for 800000 And now going forward, the seller is the bank. You pay the seller every month for your mortgage, right? Scenario number two, 200K down, same thing, right? Maybe the seller is only going to finance 500K, right? 500K as a seller, and then a bank, right? This will be a first position. And then a bank is gonna do a second for 300K, mm -hmm. right? It still totals 800K, right? It's just now it's split up between a first as a seller and a second as, as a, another bank, right? Um, third scenario, Same thing, 200K down, and now we're going to flip it, right? So now the first will be uh, 500K for the bank, and then the seller, the second will be the seller for 300K. So now the seller is a second position. And being first or second does like one of four, if it foreclosed? Does the bank then get it if it's first? Yeah. So if it forecloses, then it goes in the order, right? First position, if there's any money left over, then it goes to second, right? And stuff like that. So being in first position is always the most advantageous. And that's why first position, since there's less risk, the rate's usually going to be lower. Now, if you're a second position seller or a second position bank, your interest rate might be a little bit higher, right? But for the seller, they may not charge a higher interest rate. Right for the seller, they may just see it as, "Hey, I'm lending 300k. I know the value's there. I, I checked your credit. Everything looks good. I'm going to give you the second at four percent or five percent. The second could even be lower than what the first gave you. Maybe the first gave you a seven percent, 
and then the second was a four uh, percent. It's all negotiable. It's all negotiable. It depends on the scenario, right? Depends on the scenario. There's, there's so many different scenarios. I think the main thing is recognizing the opportunity. Yeah. Right. Well, well, so let's go to. I, I I think this is a good question, right? Like. Like maybe to to help at, to help move along this conversation, get some more knowledge to these guys. Like, why wouldn't a bank uh, 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 give them eight hundred k, right? In this scenario, right? What would be the scenario? What would be the reasons of why a bank would not give these guys the full amount? Why would they have to go out and look for a different uh, party, like a different? Uh, yeah, why wouldn't sense? the bank just lend the eight hundred k? Well, the bank could, yeah. but remember the interest. The whole reason we're looking for is because the rates are high, right? So if you're paying eight hundred k at seven percent, that could be a big payment. Right. Versus if you broke it up and you got a 500 at 7% and you got 300 at 4%, your overall payment is lower. Right. So it's cheaper for you to buy that house in a lower mortgage payment. And you can do interest only on the second. Yeah. You could even do. Yeah. It doesn't have to be principal and interest. It could be interest only on the second, which makes your payment even lower. Right. So a lot of times with these, um, actually, a lot of the times with these type of loans, they're interest only. They're actually not even principal and interest. It's very common for it to be interest only because the seller wants to collect that interest. And the and then the next common practice is the balloon payment. Mm -hmm. I'm lending it to you for five years. I'm lending it to you for 10 years. So you're going to pay me interest only for this period. And then at the end of the five years, you refinance and you pay me my full amount or you renew it. Yeah. You revisit and renew at that time. Yeah. Because the seller, as, as long as the seller is getting paid their part, which is the interest, they, they may not care if you pay the house down, yeah. right? It's not their problem, Yeah. right? Or they can negotiate a set amount like, hey, you're going to pay me my interest and then you're going to pay, you know, 200 bucks towards principal every month, right? It doesn't have to be a full principal payment, yeah. full amortized payment. So this is where now we're getting into like the, a lot of the nitty gritty and the details. I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, just know that in some cases, it's going to be advantageous to do something like this. Now let's talk about how to identify some of these opportunities, right? So number one, is if you have uh, a property that you're interested in, right? You have a client, they're interested in a property. You can pull up the property profile and see if they owe any money on the property, right? So if you go to Chicago Title or if you go to RPR, any of these, you can quickly pull up and see how much they owe, at least get an idea of what they owe. And then the next question you can do is you can call the agent and say, hey, I have a client interested in this property. Is your seller, would they be interested in doing seller financing? Right. The other thing I would look at is a property that's been sitting on the market for quite some time. Yeah. Right. They may be willing to take. You know, yeah. Like property sitting on the market for a while. They haven't been able to get it sold because the market's slower. Right. Or maybe it's a unique property, but maybe it fits the buyer's needs. And the buyer's like, hey, I'll pay you that amount if you let me, you be the bank and you give me a, a lower interest rate. Because for a lot of people right now, what they're concerned about is the monthly payment. Right. You know, the affordability. So homes that have been on the market for a while, and if they have been on, then you got to make sure that they have some equity where it can be done, right? Homes that are paid off. I'm sure we can even pull up a list of homes that are paid off. Yes, you can. Right? Yes, you can. Um, yeah. And you can reach out to people and say, hey, I have a client interested in buying. You know, they're looking for a seller who may be willing to finance, right? Maybe you have a client that won't qualify for conventional financing because they don't have a long enough job history, right? Or maybe they have some stuff on their credit, you know, that was from the past, but now they're, you know, their credit is better. Or maybe they've had a bankruptcy or something, or you know, a divorce, a divorce right? And now their situation's better, but on paper, you can't see it, but they got the money, they got the down payment, they got all that stuff. So the credit for the $800,000, like say like, or 500000 from like a, a person lending the money, does that mean, does that mean they have to give them $500,000? No, they're just, that just like as like a fictional amount of money that's been like agreed upon. No, it's coming from their equity, right? So, so let me uh, let me explain this, right? Because that, that's a good question, right? It could be confusing. So I owe zero on my house, right? I don't owe anything. It's paid off. I sell it for a million dollars. If I sell it for a million dollars, then I get a million dollars through escrow. Okay, in this case, I'm selling it for a million dollars, but I'm only going to get 500,000. And then the other 500,000 stays and I'm lending that to you and you're paying me interest. So basically the seller is only getting back whatever the difference is between the loan. It's like each time they pay you, they're getting a little more square footage of owning the house. Like that's their own equity. No, no, no. Okay. They're just, they're just, you're know. just paying the seller interest on the, on the money. Okay. It's like uh, appraisal, right? So you see how much they are borrowing. 
assuming they, they, they would have to have an appraisal. Through, they may have an appraisal, they may not, right? Okay. Right, that's the thing. You don't necessarily need an appraisal. It's just that they agree on upon the price. But then it's like you're saying that it's going to be for equity on the house, right? So when you have to have an appraisal to see what the equity on the house is. Okay. If you're going through a bank, yeah, but they can. They can get an appraisal just to make sure everyone is in agreement on the price. But let's say we looked up the comps and we already know what the home's selling for, and we say, hey, let's handshake a million bucks. You know, sounds good. That's what we're going to do. We don't need an appraisal. Exactly. So as long as as long as both parties agree, right? Is the main thing. You're creating the terms. Remember, you're creating the terms. It's lower, it's not the bank, and then the seller's happy because he's making interest on that money that he wasn't paying for the equity. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So, so the seller, the buyer gets a lower interest rate, and then the seller gets a better return than their money sitting in the bank. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's a win-win scenario. Yeah. So the seller's just not receiving all their <laughs> money up front um, because they're keeping that loan, right? They're keeping that portion as a loan. Uh, okay, so there's the two scenarios, right? To find the opportunities, right? You have a buyer, you go after a property, it's been sitting on the market, you approach the seller, or approach the listing agent. Hey, are you guys interested in doing seller financing? I have a buyer that's interested in your property. Would you guys be willing to finance, right? That's one case. The other scenario is you have a listing. Let's say you're a listing agent and you have a listing that's been sitting on the market and you ask your seller, hey, would you be interested in doing seller financing? Because this is something we can advertise to people and it can be a way to you know, market and get people in the door to get your property sold, attract more buyers, attract more buyers right? So it can be on both sides of the coin, whether you're working with the buyer or the seller, right? You could even go after properties that, have, that were expired or canceled or they pulled them off the market, right? Because maybe it couldn't sell. And now you're saying, hey, I know you had your property in the market six months ago. It looks like you didn't sell. And they may say, yeah, I couldn't get the price I wanted. Well, hey, I have a client that's willing to pay a good price if you're open to doing some sort of seller financing. I've seen it in the private comments lately, like seller financing right away at the start of the market. Yeah. Creativity. We're getting creative. It's creativity, right? You'll see stuff like seller financing. You'll see stuff like we'll pay you more commission, right? Or you'll like, there's a bonus. If you can sell this property by this date, we're willing to give you more commission, right? The listing agent will share more commission There's with no you. Rules, guys. There's, no, There's no rules, right? It's just pretty much whatever's agreed upon, yeah. as long as it's legal, yeah. right? Yeah. Then it's all yeah. real estate yeah. is all yeah. negotiable. Yeah. Real estate is all yeah. negotiable. I think we always try to confine ourselves and well, this is the way it's supposed to be done. There's a lot of ways that it can happen. Yeah. For my landlords, my landlords, I, I, I have that in the comments that my sellers, uh, uh, I have two right now that are that are land and both of them on the private remarks, they say seller is open to seller financing. Yeah. And that's another option for me to, to uh, an opportunity for me to get another buyer that maybe can't qualify for 100% of the financing, but my sellers are willing to come in there and help them out. Or even with, with land, the, we, the reason that they do seller financing sometimes is because they're going to build a property on there, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe the client, the buyer has the money to build, but doesn't have the money to build and to buy the land, right? So maybe the seller will finance it or the seller will carry a note. It, it's negotiable. They may, they may not even have to make payments. They can say, all right, all the payments are due once you, once you sell the property. Yeah. Like you can get really creative with these, with these things. Because, yeah. And then the seller says, I mean, the buyer says, all right, I'm going to buy I'm going to enter into this contract with you. I'm going to build and then we're going to sell it. And then once I sell it, I pay you off and then I make the profit and make the difference. There's all kinds of ways that you can do things. You can delay payments. You can structure it however you want, as long as the parties agree. But the most common way is like, hey, there's a monthly payment, just like you would pay the bank, except now you're paying the seller, right? So I would keep my eyes and ears open for these type of opportunities. I would ask this question when you are, inquiring on a property, right? I would just now ask this question on every property that you go show, right? Hey, is your client, is your seller interested in seller financing? Are they open to seller financing? Because how much of a value would that be if you come back to your buyer and say, hey, there's this deal right here where, you know, I know you wanted that property, but this one right here, I can get you this better deal, right? And you, you create a win-win. Or you find the deal and then you go back to your buyers who are priced out because the rates were too high 
and now you have an opportunity. Hey, I know we spoke a couple months ago. I know the rates are too high. You can afford something, but I just found out about this opportunity where they're willing to finance it at a lower rate if someone's willing to buy or pay this price. Remember, not everyone's gonna fit this box, right? But there's gonna be a small percentage of your clients that you talk to where this could be an opportunity for them. We still want Alliance Lending to do every single loan, right? But there's ones that they're not able to do, right? They're not able to do either just because the clients don't, the clients don't qualify, the rates are too high, whatever. It's the market, right? What we're dealing with right now. Um, so we're always gonna explore those options. These are for those other ones where maybe they don't fit that box. Um, start thinking to yourself as well. These could be opportunities for you guys, right? If you wanna invest into property and maybe you don't have all the money or you don't have the finances and stuff yet um, and you can work a deal with the seller. So if you have a motivated seller who has some flexibility and you have a motivated buyer, these are things that you can work out. Happens all the time, right? It's just not something that is advertised, but it happens every single day. It happens with like people buying like apartment complexes, commercial property, stuff like that. These type of deals happen all the time. Out of state deals. There's people that are willing to sell or finance. Any questions, guys? It might work for one of my clients. He just hit me last week and said that because of the, the rates, the payments are. Yeah. They're, they're, they want to move there like he just moved the trace to Tracy. Or they only qualify for a certain amount, right? That's the other thing, too. Like, let's say, okay, based off the current rates, they only qualify for this. But if I was to be able to find a seller that can do a rate one or two percent below, then they're comfortable, with that payment. they're comfortable with that payment. Now there's more purchase price there, right? You still want to look into like the two one buy down, right? Those types of things as well, because that can help bridge the gap, right? And what we're seeing right now is that we want to start uncovering, you know, any little tactic or strategy that we can do that could help us get, you know, one more client, you know, to the table. Because you're going to run into these right now. And even when you're going after listing, this is just another ad, uh, ad or value add that you can give your, your seller. Yeah. Right? Hey, this is an option. We're experiencing this, but we have we have access to this. Yep. Right. You don't need all your cash, all your capital. You can leverage this type of product, get you a higher price, then you can still make a return on your money. Yeah. Because if you're not educating your clients and you're not presenting different options, then you're not as valuable as the other guy who is educating the client, who is presenting these other options. Doesn't mean the client's going to use the option, right? But the one who comes with all these different options and all these different levels of service, those are the ones who stand out, right? If everyone that, if everyone the seller meets is only saying, hey, I can help you sell, I'll stage and I'll put it on the market. And you're saying, well, I'm going to do that. But then I also have these other options. I have a cash buyer. I have a seller financing option, the market, you know, I have an off-market situation that we can do. I have all these things that we can do. Now that other guy that they spoke to doesn't look so impressive, right? And then you're going to have to figure out, well, which, which is a good deal for the client, right? Which one makes the most sense? But that, that, not giving them the option is you're selling yourself short right there. Yeah. That, that's good to get. That to me is what I consider a great agent, right? Is when you're able to do a, to be a deal maker and a problem solver, Right. So whenever you have a scenario, work it backwards, figure out what's going on and how to problem solve. And the more tricks that you have in your bag, the more options you're able to present to the to your to your client, buyer or seller, right? To, in order to make a, a, a transaction happen. That to me is a great, there's not too many agents that I can say, think like that, right? So if you're able to think like that, to me, that's where I think, you know, things start to happen. Yeah, you separate yourself. So lastly, guys, to close, I'm always coming from a standpoint of how do we market this, right? This is a perfect opportunity to make a video. What's the video going to say? I don't expect you to explain seller financing the way I did. I expect you just to give the basics. Hey, guys, want to tell you about this awesome new thing that we're seeing happen in the market today as the rates go up. We're seeing sellers get more creative, right? And we're running into opportunities that we didn't have before. There's something called seller financing, where instead of you get borrowing your money from the bank, you're borrowing your money from the seller who's selling you the property. And the great thing is the terms are negotiable. So a lot of times we can negotiate lower interest rates and better terms than if you were to go to the bank right now. Win -win scenario. It creates a win-win. Seller gets the property sold, buyer gets to buy the property and get a lower interest rate, right? And we make the deal happen, right? If this is something you want to learn more about, reach out to me. Don't say interested. 
Don't say, would you be interested? We talked about that yesterday in script training. Would you be interested? No. Reach out to me if you would like to find out more about this. I'd be happy to break it down for you and see if it's, if it's something for you. Who can do a video like that? Real simple, right? I didn't get too detailed. Kept it real surface level. That's the thing. Videos, like the short reels, those are supposed to be real surface level, right? 30 seconds. Leave a reason for someone to call you. If you gave them all the information on the video, then they don't need to call you, right? So you throw the bait out there. You give them the basics, the little bullet points, and then you say, hey, to find out more information, if you would like me to explain this to you and see if it's right for you, feel free to reach out to me. All right, so I want to see videos from all of you guys explaining the basics, right? If you forgot what we talked about today, go on YouTube, type in seller financing explained, and there's probably a thousand videos who probably explained it a little bit better than me, right? Because I just kind of freestyled this right now. Um, find the shortest video that you can find, like the one or two minute who can explain it real simple, and then you can go and repost that or re replicate that and make your own video, right? But this is now ways for you guys to market yourself, brand yourself and separate yourself from the audience. Cause I guarantee you the other people you're following right now, there's very, very few, if any, that are talking about seller financing right now. They're not, right? Cause most agents don't know about this, honestly. We, I mean, we, we've known about, but we, we haven't, we haven't used, used in a long time. Used for a while. Yeah. This is something that was talking about Monday. Someone brought it up on Monday yeah. on the mastermind. So again, this is this is why we continue to also do the training so we can bring it back to you guys. Yep. Any questions, guys? Any comments? Yep. And mine are going to say, so if they do want to do seller financing, do they don't go with Alliance? Do they go with the title company? Yeah. So just to keep it simple, right? Instead of Alliance being the bank, the seller, John Smith, is the bank. So you don't, right? It's two different scenarios, right? But if you have a question, basically, you can reach out to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah, but yeah, Alliance wouldn't be doing any of the work on it. But if you have questions, definitely reach out to us. But yeah, like Enrique has explained it, it's going to be that person is going to be the lender. Yeah. Because remember, like, it's going to be a small percentage that fit into this box, right? Because you have to have the seller, you have to have the buyer, you have to have all the right things lined up. So still go about your process the same exact way, right? Get them on a call, get them on a consult, see if Alliance can help them out and do the loan. Because if it, we can, then we just go that route. That's the easiest route. Yeah. It's when we have these clients who we already did that and they just can't qualify and we're trying to look for things outside of the box. That's when we start looking for these opportunities. But Alliance still does the part that is the loan from the bank. So if exactly. there's going to be a loan from the bank, then yeah, then you can work with Alliance to do that part. And then title just the person. Yeah. But remember, there's three different scenarios. There may be one where there's no alliance where we don't need that, depending on the seller situation. There may be one where it's a combination of both, right? Alliance does the first, seller does the second, or flip it around. Uh, seller does the first, alliance does the second, right? So don't change anything in your process. It's just once you get to that roadblock where you're like, hey, I have this client. They really want to buy. They have down payment. Just the payment is, too, is not affordable. You know, what options do we have? Can we do a two one buy down? Let's explore all those options first with what we have. And then if we don't have this. This is one more option that we can try after we've exhausted the other ones. Actually, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, have, you ever seen, have you ever seen uh, uh, the seller financing be in first position? With yeah, lender, seller financing with could be in first position. Oh, I know it can, but ha have we, has, has sellers, has, uh, has agents given up that position? I'm sorry, has lenders given up that position? Yeah, if you have a, it's lenders do seconds all the time, right? It's just like doing a first and a second. So it doesn't matter. Like if they're in second position, then they have a different set of rules. Yeah, you could even get a hard money second. You can get any second, right? If you got a home equity line of credit and you have a first and you got a, a HELOC, that's in second position. Right, right, right. I think sometimes we're thinking it's a whole different process. The same exact yeah. process, right? I think the main thing, guys, is I like what Eric is saying. We're not changing our process. This is just another product. Right? Yeah. It's going to fit everyone? No. It's going to fit a very few amount of people, but it's just something to be aware of, to be to have on top of mind that, hey, we do have this other option. Where yeah. Typically, it's going to go 99% of the time, it's going to go traditionally the way we've been doing it. Yeah. That 1% to 2% is going to be where this comes into an opportunity. Yeah. But I would say this, as a listing agent, I would be leveraging this on every listing appointment, yeah. letting them know, hey, listen, we have this as well. 
because that immediately separates you from 90% of yeah. our listing agents. So any listings we have that are sitting on the market, this go do your research. How much do they owe on the property? Is there an even, appointment. yeah, on your listing appointment, present this, go talk to your sellers. Hey, is this an option you're willing to do to get the property sold? Right. Right. Do you need all your money right away? Because in some cases they, they don't. All right, guys, I don't want to go too deep because then it's going to confuse you guys a little bit. Um, but if you have questions or you think you have a scenario, just reach out to me yeah. or Jason and yeah, I'll tell you, hey, and then after you run through a couple scenarios, then you'll know, all right, that, you kind of get the hang of it, all right? And then, yeah, definitely reach out to us if you guys have a scenario like that. Yeah. We're definitely here. He can't uh, go ahead and do what he wants to interview for the deal. Like I said, you'll do it with me. All right, let's do it. Uh, all right, we're going to end. Uh... Before I do it, hey. Stop recording here. Back in the day, right? In front of everyone. This is how it's going to be done.